Good morning. Uh, I'm Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick Collection. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Full Circle, the Medal in Art History, a symposium in honor of Stephen K. Sure. This symposium marks the last week of the exhibition, The Pursuit of Immortality, Masterpieces from the Schur Collection of Portrait Medals. This exhibition was organized by Amy Eng, associate curator at the Frick Collection, and Stephen Schur. The symposium is part of... Ah, well, let's have the first of, I hope, many rounds of applause for Stephen Schur. Um, the symposium is part of the cycle of exhibition, scholarly conference, and book that ideally accompanies the presentation of art in a museum. The full catalog of the Schur collection is well underway and will be published in the coming year. In the meantime, Amy Eng has uh, written a short handbook to accompany the exhibition and to serve as an introduction to the subject of medals, which continues to be an underappreciated area of the arts and one which needs explication to nearly everyone except perhaps the audience in this room. It is our hope that with the gift of a major part of the Schur Medal Collection to the Frick, we may become a center of the study of the medal. And through symposia such as this, lectures, publications, and fellowships make medals better known and understood. For me personally, this occasion, occasion also marks a kind of full circle. When he was chairman of the Department of Art History at Brown University, Stephen taught me art history at the undergraduate level around 1971. Shortly after that, he left academe to run the family firm Schur Chemicals. But he continued to be active with scholarship uh, in his specialty of medieval art and increasingly on metals, and began in earnest pursuing an interest he had had from an early age, the collecting of metals. As you all know, over the course of several decades, he and his wife, Janie Wu, assembled the finest private collection of portrait medals. Dr. Schur has also had long-standing ties to the Frick Collection, as well as other museums. He was the principal organizer of the Currency of Fame at the National Gallery, Washington, and the Frick, 1994, and three years later, the Proud Republic, about Dutch medals of the 17th century, which took place here at the Frick. Given this long association with the institution, it is immensely gratifying that he and Janie have decided to give the major portion of their collection to the Frick. It is a perfect match for our holdings, which range from the Renaissance through the beginning of the 20th century in Europe, as does this collection, is rich in portraiture, particularly in paintings, and which contains a distinguished collection of Renaissance bronze statuettes, many of them modeled by sculptors such as Antico Bertoldo, who also made medals. The exhibition makes the connection between metals and a number of works in different media in our permanent collection. Indeed, it makes the point that metals deserve and require to be seen alongside other artistic media. We are also an institution whose intimate scale, domestic context, and high level of quality encourage close scrutiny of works of art. This is really what metals demand too, close looking. We look forward to creating a gallery devoted to metals in the forthcoming renovation of the second floor. I'm pleased to acknowledge those who funded the exhibition. There's a long list of those which we uh, have published in many locations, but I particularly want to thank the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation. Of course, I thank Stephen and Jenny Wu Schur for all that they have done to bring the collection here. I thank all the lecturers who will be, have come from afar to be with us today. And finally, the conveners of this symposium, uh, Amy Ng, Melanie Vandenbroek, and Robert Wellington. Uh, Robert will start first and be followed by Robert. Thank you. Be followed by Amy. I'd like to begin by thanking my co-conveners, Melanie Vandenbroek and Amy Ng, for making this event such a pleasure to work on. Sadly, Melanie can't be with us today, but this symposium, both in its theoretical shape and its impressive lineup, would not have been possible without the wisdom and enthusiasm that she has brought to this project. 
But most of all, I'd like to thank Stephen Scher for his extraordinary generosity as a scholar and a patron, and for making what I believe will be a field-changing gift of medals to this august collection. By placing these often strange, terse, esoteric, handheld sculptures on display alongside masterpieces of fine and decorative arts found at the Frick, this gift extends Stephen's long-held mission to rehabilitate the medal within the popular narrative of art history, a project that we pay homage to uh, through the theme of this symposium that we hold in his honour. I, like Stephen, have come to understand the central role of portrait medals in the culture of early modern Europe. The preeminent position that they once held has been diminished in the public Im imagination, uh, placed in drawers or sometimes amassed in unappealing displays in museum vitrines. We can forgive those who have passed them by in favor of flashier paintings and sculptures. I came to medals through my work on Louis, Louis XIV, who commissioned hundreds of them to commemorate his reign. Um, while the Sun King is better remembered for his vast palaces and their lavish gilded trappings, I came to understand that medals are at the centre of Louis XIV's political, cultural and historical projects. Louis' fascination for medals started when he was a boy, when he was taught history through coins and medals by one of the greatest medalists of the early modern age, Jean Forin. One of, and I, I couldn't resist but show you this wonderful image of Vorhan uh, teaching the king. One of Vorhan's finest medals can be seen in the current exhibition, a double portrait of Louis as a child with his mother. By the time this medal was cast to commemorate the fulfillment of the queen's vow to build the church of Val de Grasse for, the, for giving birth to the future king of France, the art of the medal had flourished in Europe for over 200 years. I know this is contested by some in this room, but I would say that the medal reached its apogee with Jean Forin. Forgive me. Like nearly all early modern medals, this one records the likeness of illustrious people. It links these people to events and extols their virtues. It records the plans that they made to secure their posthumous reputations through grand buildings and monuments. To that end, Vorhan's Val de Grasse medal belongs to a special species of object made to be buried in the foundation of a building that is shown on its reverse. This act of burying medals in foundations imagines a time far into the future when only ruins remain of the grand schemes of once great princes and princesses of the church and state. The medal is thus a conduit between the past and the future, the study of medals lays bare the aesthetic landscape of the six centuries in which they enjoyed wide popularity and provides vital insights into the social and political history of modern Europe, a notion powerfully evoked by the medals on display in the exhibition, The Pursuit of Immortality, here at the Frick. My, uh, my fellow conveners and I were delighted by the response that we received from our call for papers. The difficult process of selecting speakers uh, from the many uh, papers we received was informed by our hope to bring new voices to the study of medals from early career scholars and art historians who do not typically work on them. Susan Dackerman, Martin Hirsch, Geoffrey Collins and Iris Moon will explore the inherent intermediality of medals made together with prints, paintings, ceramics and architecture. Ilaria Bernocchi, Emily Fenichel and Hannah Williams show what medals can teach us about the identity of artists as both makers and subjects of medals. And finally, Anna Seidel and Emerson Boyer uh, explore issues of reception, replication and dissemination of medals in the 19th century. In sum, the talks we shall hear today showcase the place of medals within networks of artistic practice from the 15th to 19th century across Europe and we hope you enjoy the symposium. And before I leave uh, uh, the stand here, I'd like to just read a few words from our wonderful colleague, Melanie Vandenbroek, who sadly can't be here with us today. Uh, Dear attendees, co-conveners, Frick Collection staff, speakers, and last but not least, Stephen Scher. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to work with Amy Ng and Robert Wellington on putting this conference program together, and it is with great regret that I cannot be with you today, being kept firmly on the ground of another continent by my, the final weeks of pregnancy. I see today a moment of intellectual stimulation and celebration. This symposium follows the same spirit from which medals were conceived as objects demanding close scrutiny, elevated conversation and scholarly inquiry. 
Celebration, because this gathering marks the gift of one of the greatest collections of medals ever assembled. This leads Melanie to, uh, uh, to the generosity of, in spirit that underpins this day. The generosity of her co-conveners in being mutually supportive of each other's ideas and enthusiasm, but more crucially, as everyone present in this room will be benefiting from, the tremendous generosity shown by Stephen. Not only for sharing his collection with the widest audience through the thrick, Frick, but also for having been over the years privately as much as in writing or through exhibitions, lavish with his time and expertise in sharing his fascination for these small handheld sculptures. Uh, and she wishes us all an enlightening day. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. And I, I now uh, will welcome to the podium Amy Ng. I'm sorry, Amy. <laughs> Can we have the lights down, please? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Our speakers and attendees who have traveled from near and far at what is always a busy time of year, and Frick staff members who have made today possible. And I'd like to point out in particular Gemma McElroy, Persephone Allen, Vince Tolentino, Caitlin Henningsen, Rachel Himes, and Adrian Lay, and up in the box, Sean Troxell and Amanda Orkanian. Thanks to Robert and Melanie, whose great idea it was to hold today's symposium and who are ideal collaborators. Ian Wardropper worked for many years to make the Frick the perfect home for the Shore Collection. He and Peter J. Sharp, chief curator Xavier Salomon, have been essential to the realization of the exhibition and today's symposium. My heartfelt thanks to both. Over the last two and a half years, I have had the great privilege of working closely with Steve. I should probably show you this one to prove that we did have mirth, <laughs> although Steve will probably want this on the stage where he's doing the talking. I am uncharacteristically meek in this picture. Over the last two and a half years, I've had the great privilege of working closely with Steve on the exhibition and on the catalog of his collection. I've had a few opportunities to thank him for his generosity and mentorship, and today is yet another. Thank you, Steve, for your passion that has inspired and guided so many of us. But today we do more than thank you, Steve. Today we celebrate you, your collection, and your contribution to the study of these rich and rewarding objects that have been so defining of your life and work. I wanted to say a quick word about the display of medals, the notoriously difficult task of presenting small, double-sided objects. For the study of medals is, I think you'll agree, closely connected to the way scholars, students, and the public encounter them. In conceiving of our display, we scoured the world. We amassed a database of hundreds of displays we had seen all over North America and Europe. We found no perfect solution, and we still haven't, though we're getting closer, I think. But it was heartening to know that basically everyone was struggling with this problem, too. We had three primary goals, and this is a photograph uh, from the exhibition downstairs. The first was to show as many medals as possible double-sided, to emphasize the sculptural aspect of these objects. The second was to create rich interactions between metals and other works of art, paintings, sculptures, works on paper from the Frick's own collection, to underline the place of metals in a larger history of art. And the third was to offer as many different ways as possible of seeing metals. For metals are so varied, so diverse in making, function, and appearance that a single way of viewing could not suffice. So in the galleries, you will see Pisanello's Cecilia Gonzaga turning slowly to convey the dynamism of the art form of objects primarily meant to be handled, turned, passed from one hand to another, experienced in motion. In a small box, visitors can turn Antico's medal of Antonia del Balzo, 
And this device was inspired by an 18th century letter describing medals in the Farnese collection in Naples, medals affixed to a rod like little fish on a skewer. In the exhibition catalog, we found ways to break the plane, so to speak, of illustrating medals on the page, oblique angles, profiles of medals, the edge, to give the reader that the sense that these are more than two-dimensional images. All of this is to say that our presentation of the Schur medals was inspired by the scholarship that Steve and others have promoted over the years and which we celebrate today, medals as sculpture medals as part of a larger history of art, medals as so complex, diverse, and rich an art form that it's hard to define exactly what is a medal. This symposium centers on the medal in art history, taking a deliberate focus on medals and something else. It breaks the traditional boundaries of studying the medal within the constraint of its own medium or within numismatics. However, I want to be very clear that many of today's explorations rely on so-called pure metals scholarship, the meticulous cataloging, measuring, XRFing, interpreting of metals. It's our hope that this symposium forwards the conversation about and with metals. And already the program's diversity of topics and speakers indicates a rich moment in and future of the study of metals in art history.